This podcast contains adult themes and graphic violence. Listener discretion is advised. A commercial-free version of this podcast is available on Patreon for $1 per month. Patreon.com forward slash Beyond Contempt Podcast. I'm Renee, and this is Beyond Contempt True Crime. There are many reasons why people are interested in true crime. Some of us are rubberneckers and can't look away when we see something awful. Others are deeply fascinated and want to understand why human beings commit terrible acts. And there are a portion of us who yearn to be prepared. We want to know the possibilities of awful things that could happen to us and are looking for the signs so we can prevent and avoid it. In today's episode, we have two different stories of professors who committed horrible crimes. Some might have seen their minor faults and negative traits, but just around the edges, the truth was no one could have expected, predicted, or prevented what happened. You're listening to Episode 49, George Zinkin and Max Bernard Frank. George Zinkin III was a bright young man. In 1974, he graduated with a B.A. in English from Swarthmore College, which was a top liberal arts college in Pennsylvania. George attended the University of Michigan, where he received both a master and a doctorate in business administration. In 1981, after he finished his education, he took a job teaching marketing classes for the University of Houston. George stayed at the University of Houston for 13 years. During that time, he also taught at the University of Pittsburgh in 1987. In 1994, George took a teaching job with the Business College at the University of Georgia, where he served as a department head and held a prestigious endowed chair. He primarily taught business and marketing classes for the college. George had earned the respect of his colleagues. He won awards for his research and teaching contributions. Many academics were under the pressure to publish or perish. George did not perish, and he had published over 100 articles in a variety of academic journals. He was a prolific editor and edited journal articles and books. George was also a poet and published many of his poems. During this time of notable achievement, George was married and had children, but then divorced. Eventually, he met a woman named Marie Bruce. She was a driven person who hailed from the Augusta, Georgia area and finished law school in 1998. Marie's final career destination was family law. She married George, and they had a daughter and son together. The family lived in Bogart, not far away from Athens. Besides all his duties at the University of Georgia, George also taught marketing at VU University in Amsterdam. April 25, 2009, was a significant time for Athens, Georgia, as they hosted several bike races for their yearly Twilight series. The crown jewel of the weekend was always the Athens Twilight Criterium. Thousands of people descended on the city to watch one of the fastest and most well-known races on the domestic circuit. This was the same weekend that the Town and Gown Community Theater Group of Athens was having a picnic gathering for all current and past members. That evening they were presenting a play called Sherlock Holmes, The Final Adventure. Marie Bruce and George Zinkin were there with their children, enjoying the day. Besides being a lawyer and a mother, Marie had dedicated 20 years of her life serving the Town and Gown Theater Group. She contributed to the organization in many ways, and not only acted in plays, but served time as the president of the board, and even took on administrative duties of collecting donations. Marie Bruce's marriage to George Zinkin had been strained, and they got into an argument around 11.30 a.m. that day. Zinkin took their two children and put them in his car. He returned to the area where the theater group was congregating. Zinkin walked up to 40-year-old Thomas Tanner and shot him at close range in the back of the head. He next shot 63-year-old Ben Teague. Zinkin ran out of bullets and inserted a new clip into his gun. He shot his 47-year-old wife, Marie Bruce, 
as she worked the theater's donation station. Everyone from the theater group ran screaming from the area. George Sinkin fled the crime scene as well. Tom Tanner had a daughter and worked as the director of the Regional Dynamics Economic Modeling Laboratory at Clemson University. He was also a creative and dedicated much of his time to the Town and Gowan Theater Group. Tom had a starring role as Watson for the play that night. Ben Teague was a kind-hearted individual and a father figure to many in the theater. He was older and had been with his English professor wife, Fran, for 40 years. Ben was well-educated and served as a translator of the German, Russian, and English languages. Tom Tanner, Ben Teague, and Marie Bruce all died that day, and two innocent bystanders sustained injuries from the bullet fragments. An arrest warrant was issued for George Sinkin, and they charged him with three counts of murder. Many of the officers involved in the search had never worked on a case that involved multiple murders. If residents had not yet heard about the shootings, they were knowledgeable after the festive buzz was broken by groups of officers donning combat gear who descended on the downtown area and kicked off the massive search for George Sinkin. It was a sight that Athens residents didn't think was possible in their community and was reminiscent of what other cities looked like after 9-11. People locked themselves inside their homes, glued their eyes to their TV, and watched one of the largest manhunts unfold in their beloved city of Athens. The search was so intensive that Zinkin made America's Most Wanted. They considered the once-respected professor armed and dangerous. One witness to the murders described Zinkin as disconnected, methodical, and lacking emotion. April 25, 2009, went down as one of the worst days experienced by many in the community. The Town and Gown Theater Group referred to it plainly but succinctly as the tragedy. The next day on April 26, 2009, a federal arrest warrant was issued, and they charged Zinkin with unlawful flight to avoid prosecution. Law enforcement was trying to figure out what could have motivated a well-respected professor to commit such a brutal triple murder. The murder of Ben Teague was a mystery. His only possible infraction was he initially stepped in and tried to calm Marie and George down when they were arguing. He was collateral damage and happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. After a brief investigation, the motive behind killing Marie Bruce and Thomas Tanner was clear. Marie Bruce and George Zinkin's marriage was on shaky ground, and he wanted to repair the relationship. They had been going to marriage counseling, but their situation was deteriorating. She was having an affair with Thomas Tanner. Marie removed her name from one of the couple's joint bank accounts in February. Law enforcement believed that Zinkin was collecting evidence to prepare for a divorce, and he had secretly recorded a conversation between Marie and Thomas. Zinkin's children were in the car during the shooting, and he drove them home afterward, dropped them with his neighbor, Bob Covington, said he had an emergency, and sprinted off. Police took over Bob Covington's home and asked his daughter to draw a floor plan of the Zinkin's house because she was their babysitter and could direct them to the hidden spare key. Zinkin's kids were unaware of the murders. However, when police asked Zinkin's daughter about her father's emergency, she said it had something to do with a firecracker. Police soon discovered Zinkin was not at home and he was already on the run. Bob Covington had a lot of awkward moments with his neighbor, George Zinkin. They would find themselves at the mailbox at the same time. Bob, being a polite neighbor, would mention that his son, who used to cut the Zinkin's grass, had seen him on the UGA campus since he was attending college there. Zinkin's response was, Yeah, that's where I hang out. He said nothing further, turned, and walked straight back into his house. Marie Bruce was more outgoing, polite, and engaging than her husband. Even with their polar opposite personalities, Bob never saw trouble or heard Zinkin raise his voice to his kids or wife. When George Zinkin's name was put out in the media as the prime suspect, the University of Georgia dismissed him as an employee. They warned the university students to proceed with caution until authorities found him. Many of George Zinkin's students could not believe he was capable of such a crime. At worst, they thought he was quirky. 
Zinkin wasn't prone to tucking in his shirt like some of the other business professors. He walked around barefoot and ate popcorn out of garbage cans. While certain professors found Zinkin to be standoffish and introverted, others thought he was a genius. Some colleagues wanted to defend him, but did not want to do it on the record because he was now an alleged murderer. They saw him in tender moments, like when he brought his daughter and son, ages 10 and 8, to work. Sinkin's colleagues weren't aware of the details of his personal life, but sensed he was having problems at home, because he dropped about 50 pounds two months prior to the murders. A team of FBI agents from a variety of states came to Georgia to help with the manhunt. They looked for anyone and everyone that was possibly connected to George Zinkin. Family, friends, and acquaintances were all spoken with. The picture that the interviews painted in the minds of law enforcement was that Zinkin was a highly intelligent person, but was someone who possessed an explosive personality and was capable of murder. The search carried on for just under two weeks. On April 30th, 2009, Zinkin's red jeep was found not far away from his house in a ravine in the rural town of Bogart. He rolled the jeep, but it wasn't entirely wrecked, and he pushed it for a short distance. Zinkin's dying cell phone battery pinged a nearby cell tower, and that was how the officers discovered his jeep. They weren't certain how long the vehicle had been stranded. There were no signs of blood or any clues as to what direction he might have escaped. As a precaution, they locked a nearby elementary school. In the Jeep, there was a laptop, a Blackberry, a passport, $51 in a wallet, and another $1,047.77 in a bag. There were six spent shell casings from a 38 caliber, and there were documents that contained information about Thomas Tanner. Law enforcement searched the 200-acre area around the ravine, and they did not find Zinkin. Detectives uncovered that he had booked a flight to Amsterdam a week after the murders, since he had taught as a part-time instructor at VU on summer breaks. He reportedly owned a home there. The search was over on May 9, 2009, when George Zinkin's body was found about a mile from his Jeep, thanks to the work at Cadaver Dogs. Zinkin dug a 15- to 18-inch deep hole in the woods, laid down in the hole, and pulled a wooden pallet over himself. He had already covered the pallet with dirt and debris to camouflage his makeshift grave. Zinkin fired one shot from his 38 caliber handgun into his head. Zinkin's body went unclaimed for a while and was scheduled for a pauper's burial, but a son from a previous marriage who lived in Utah claimed his dad's body. As if the situation wasn't awful enough, George Zinkin and Marie Bruce's two kids were caught in an ongoing custody battle. A judge awarded $3.5 million from Zinkin's estate to their two kids, but the court battles and attorney's fees slowly drew that money down. There was a fight in the legal system between George's brother, Chris Zinkin, and Marie's brother, Lawrence, and his wife, Donna Bruce. The Bruce's were awarded temporary custody of the children after the murders. Chris was their elected legal guardian, which was set up prior to the murders. The Bruces wanted to know why Chris Zinkin didn't connect with the children until 110 days after their mother was murdered. Two years after the tragedy, the children were still living with the Bruces, but it was not reported if the courts legally ordered them to live with Chris Zinkin. This tragedy could not have been predicted but there were certainly cracks around the edges of George Zinkin's personal and professional conduct throughout the years. In 1993, two of his female colleagues sued Zinkin and the University of Houston where he taught. The case settled outside of the court system, and the women signed a confidentiality clause, so the details of the complaints or the monetary settlement were never publicized. They sealed the documents as to not affect Zinkin's future employment opportunities. When he looked for a new teaching job at the University of Georgia, the group responsible for hiring him wasn't entirely aware of the settlement. Some people Zinkin worked with were on the receiving end of his narcissism. He asked his assistant to make copies of pornographic literature. Zinkin had affairs with subordinates, and it was even rumored that he had sex in his office at UGA. 
Barbara Carroll was one colleague that Zink and Bud had heads with over the years, and they spent significant energy slinging complaints back and forth. She was aware of his troubled past at the University of Houston with the lawsuits. Barbara had sent out emails about him to staff years prior to the murders, but they never received much engagement. She told their colleagues that he had a troubled history with women, especially when he was in a position of power over them. And they all had to bear some responsibility if they didn't address his behavior. Many of the colleagues that Barbara emailed did not want to get in the middle of the situation or weren't looking to assume responsibility since the complaints with Zinkin were not of a formal or official nature. After the murders and during the manhunt, detectives found printed map quest directions to Barbara Carroll's house in Zinkin's abandoned Jeep. She immediately went into protective custody. The triple murder probably didn't surprise Barbara Carroll, but most people in Zinkin's life didn't see it coming and could not have predicted the tragic outcome. We're going to shift over to the second story, right after we take a quick break to hear from our sponsor. Thank you to Best Fiends for sponsoring this episode of Beyond Contempt True Crime. Even though I'm a little bit stuck and can't seem to break into the 600 levels. But hey, I've never been on that high of a level before with anything in my life, so don't worry, I'll keep at it. I like to sneak a few extra games in when I need to take a break, especially from watching too many true crime TikToks, which is like my new favorite thing. Best Fiends is endless fun with thousands of levels to play and countless cute characters to collect. It's a casual game that you play on your phone, and you don't even need to be tethered to Wi-Fi because you can play it without an internet connection, which is great for me because my internet provider sometimes drops the ball. The challenging levels will help you maintain your A-game and will keep your noodle sharp. More importantly, I know you will enjoy this game, so download Best Fiends, free on the Apple App Store or Google Play. That's friends without the R, Best Fiends. Now, back to the show. 17-year-old Tracy Leroy Newt had been a handful of a kid. Tracy's mother, Judy Newt, had a difficult time raising him. While she described him as a sweet and sentimental kid, she also said he was rowdy. Tracy spent time in juvenile homes because there were stretches when Judy just couldn't handle him but Judy believed he wasn't any more difficult than other boys his age. Despite those childhood issues, Tracy had big dreams. He wanted to become an actor and yearned to live a fantastic life beyond what Kansas City, Missouri offered him. In spring 1987, Tracy headed to Los Angeles, California, driven by the belief that he could make it onto the big screen. He bleached his black hair blonde, and was ready to intake the sights and sounds of Hollywood. Judy Newt was worried about her son. She felt he was naive. He assured her he was okay and that everything would be fine. When Tracy arrived in California, the truth was like a glass of ice-cold water splashed onto his face. There were no acting jobs open to an unseasoned kid like Tracy. His dreams wouldn't be fulfilled, and it was difficult even finding a simple job to support himself. He moved around to different youth centers, never staying too long in one place. This young man turned to selling himself to make ends meet. The transactional interactions of his body for money were not just financial. They were emotional, according to the director of youth services at the Gay and Lesbian Community Center in L.A. Tracy needed love and security, and being a young gay teen in the 80s in Missouri had not provided him with much experience in that part of his life. The Gay and Lesbian Center provided support for gay and straight runaway teens and offered food, clothing, and shelter. The director's assessment of Tracy was that he was a sweet kid, but was unhappy. Unhappy in Kansas City, but also unhappy in Los Angeles. Another counselor at the center agreed with his mom that Tracy was naive. Unfortunately, that lack of experience would get Tracy in over his head. On August 25, 1987, a rancher made a gruesome discovery in Madura County, which was just north of Fresno. A man's head and torso were found along the side of the highway. 
They estimated that the man was five foot seven and 160 pounds with a muscular build. The body had been there for a few days, and there was a gunshot wound in the back of the head. Two days later, 200 miles south off of I-5 in Valencia, more body parts were found in a mutilated state. Law enforcement was trying to determine if the arms and legs belonged to the same victim. Right after they found the body parts, a Hollywood store contacted the Los Angeles Police Department. A person rented a chainsaw for the day and returned it with blood and flesh lodged throughout the saw's chain. The LAPD took the chainsaw as evidence on August 28, 1987. The 57-year-old customer who picked up the tool paid $41 for the rental and used his real name, which was Max Bernard Frank. Frank was a political science professor at California State University, Fresno. He was all the way from De Pere, Wisconsin. Frank attended the University of Wisconsin as an undergrad and received his Ph.D. from New York University. He started teaching at Fresno in 1969. Frank was a lifelong bachelor who owned a house in Fresno and had an apartment on Genesee Avenue in West Hollywood, where he stayed on the weekends. He had just started his sabbatical that fall and had been living in his apartment. Police tracked down Frank on August 29, 1987. When detectives questioned him, Frank claimed that he accidentally killed a dog with his car, then cut the dog up with a chainsaw. Frank couldn't tell the officer exactly where he hit the dog, but it was near Beverly Hills. He buried the animal somewhere off Interstate 5. The dog belonged to someone who was affiliated with the underground, so he was trying to conceal what happened. When detectives started searching Frank's apartment, they found human blood, and they believed that this was where the murder took place. They arrested him that day. When LAPD searched Frank's apartment, they found the largest collection of gay pornography they had ever seen. The 1980s were an analog age, and Frank's pornography was in the tangible form of books, magazines, and movies. Max Bernard Frank had been living a double life and was doing everything in his power to keep from being outed. He had his more conservative professor's life in Fresno and a secret gay life in West Hollywood, where, at a minimum, he paid young men so he could photograph them in sexually compromising positions. The most concerning discovery in his apartment was that he was constructing a soundproof room inside of his living room. Detectives told Frank that the blood in his apartment was human. With this information, Frank's story changed. He said there was another man involved in the incident, and his name was Terry Adams. Frank had known Adams for five years, and he had even lived with Frank for a while in Fresno. He said Terry Adams was a 30-year-old homeless man with shoulder-length blonde hair who exchanged his body for money to get by. Frank said he was on Santa Monica Boulevard when he ran into 18-year-old Tracy Newt at a hot dog stand. Tracy owed him money so Frank invited him back to his apartment. Frank collected 10 of the $40 that Tracy owed him. He said his friend Terry Adams stepped by the apartment, and an altercation took place between Tracy and Terry. Tracy had a knife and was waving it around and threatening Terry Adams. Frank said he realized that Terry had a gun in my hand. Then he corrected his statement to say, Terry had a gun in his hand and laughed over his Freudian slip. He said Adams must have grabbed the gun from underneath his bed and shot Tracy nude in the apartment. Adams first shot Tracy in the abdomen, and when Tracy was still alive, vocalizing and whining, Adams shot him in the head to finish the job. He hauled the body into Frank's bathroom, grabbed a saw that was located under the sink, and dismembered the body by cutting off the victim's arms and legs. Adams told Frank to leave the apartment and Frank said he left for about two and a half hours. He returned to his apartment and felt so subdued because of what he witnessed and he could not take action due to fear. The next day, Adam sent Frank to the rental store to pick up a chainsaw so they could cut up the rest of the body. Adam said that they were going to spread the body parts around to make it difficult on law enforcement. Frank said that the only crime he committed was going along with this part of the plan. Of course, LAPD looked for Terry Adams, 
but could not locate him, and decided that Terry Adams was a creation of Frank's imagination. The prosecutor said that even if Terry Adams was real, Frank was just as guilty for his role he played in the murder. However, the attendant from the store who rented the chainsaw said that Max Frank was the person who picked it up, but it was a blonde man in his 20s who returned it. California State University Fresno eventually fired Frank after learning about his arrest. The university asked one of the department's secretaries to pack up Frank's office. On September 23, 1987, she discovered a 38 caliber revolver inside of Frank's desk. When the revolver was tested, it was the gun that shot the bullet into the head of Tracy Newt. Frank's colleagues were surprised, since they had always respected him and thought he had a gentle way in which he moved through the world. Max Frank's family was shocked and saddened by his arrest. Frank's 55-year-old sister, Carol, was dismayed. Just like some of the university faculty, she characterized her brother's personality as gentle. Carol was a social worker who lived in Philadelphia. She knew her brother was gay, but her elderly parents had no clue. Carol was worried about their father, who was recovering from a heart attack he experienced a few months prior. 82-year-old Max Frank and 80-year-old Grace Frank only learned about their son's sexuality and arrest for murder when they received a call from a Milwaukee newspaper reporter. The Franks were a deeply religious family and lived in the small community of De Pere, which was close in proximity to Green Bay, Wisconsin. This whole situation was hard for Max and Grace Frank to digest. LAPD believed that Tracy knew it was struggling and was trapped in a transient life. His state ID card said he lived in Sam's Family Spa Mobile Park in Sky Valley, which was about two and a half hours away from West Hollywood. The ID listed Dillon Road, apartment 46, as his address. In space 46 rested a double-wide trailer that had a for-sale sign in the window. It was unclear if he was staying there or had only visited for a short time. Despite the address on his ID, Tracy was confirmed to have been in the Los Angeles area prior to his death. An anonymous man said he'd met the teen at a restaurant in Los Angeles. Tracy said he was looking for some big city excitement, but he wasn't a fan of the hot Southern California temperatures. He stayed with the anonymous man for a few days around the time of August 17th. The man never saw Tracy again, and a few days later, he was dead. Once this tragedy made its way into the newsroom, the Fresno Bee published a story about Max Frank's former students who said they were propositioned by him and had called the police. One student said they filed a sexual harassment complaint with the university the year prior. The university denied that they ever received this complaint. Max Bernard Frank was charged with murder and robbery. He entered a plea of not guilty. The trial lasted about four weeks, and the defendant did not take the stand in his own defense. The prosecution pushed for the death penalty because of the depraved nature of the killing and built a case around the motive of homosexual rage. They tried to convey that the powerful fear of being outed drove Frank to commit this heinous crime. The prosecution had a strong circumstantial case. When law enforcement went through Frank's large gay pornography collection, they found explicit pictures of Tracy Newt. The chainsaw Frank rented had blood evidence on it. They found blood inside his apartment and car. The bullet that killed the victim had been fired from the defendant's gun. Frank had been identified by an eyewitness sitting in his car at the McBean Parkway exit after the murder, and this was where the victim's body parts were found. Frank's defense attorney argued that Terry Adams was really a man named Peter Kryzak. He had been tried four times for the murder of two Mount Washington men who were shot and dismembered. Kryzak had a sexual relationship with one of the men, Melvin Amato. The other man, John Lachetto, was Melvin's roommate. They built the case on top of circumstantial evidence that Melvin threatened to send Kryzak's parents videotapes to prove they had a homosexual affair. Melvin and John were killed in June 1980, and in July they were dismembered, their parts were frozen, and their house was set on fire. 
The crime scene was discovered by firefighters, and Kryzik was arrested. He had taken $11,500 in cash and $14,000 worth of jewelry from Melvin. Kryzik had four trials over five years. Three trials had hung juries, and they convicted him in one trial, but the decision was reversed after appeal. Kryzik denied that he was Terry Adams. The defense tried to use gay stereotypes and argued that Max Frank was too inept to shoot a gun or use a chainsaw. They stated that Frank had gone to extreme lengths and cemented his entire yard in Fresno so he wouldn't have to cut the grass. They had Frank's sister testify that he was too much of a sissy and a weakling to use power tools. The defense tried to convince the jury that Frank did not have the personal fortitude or strength to commit the murder. The pathologist who conducted the autopsy declared that the cause of Tracy Newt's death was the gunshot wound to the back of the head, and there was no evidence that the victim was alive during the dismemberment, since there were no traumatic hemorrhages seen in the body parts or the torso. After the jury debated for two and a half days, they found Max Bernard Frank guilty of the first-degree murder of Tracy Newt. The defendant lacked a reaction during the reading of the verdict. Frank's lawyers tried to push for a new trial and wanted the judge to reduce the conviction to a lesser charge of second-degree murder or voluntary manslaughter. These motions were denied because the judge believed the circumstantial evidence was overwhelming. The prosecution said that Frank should just be happy that they did not send him to the gas chamber. Initially, the prosecution had pursued the death penalty, but failed to achieve that outcome. At that time in California, to get a capital conviction, a defendant needed to be found guilty of special circumstance allegations. Those two allegations in Frank's case were that the murder was exceptionally heinous and that he committed the murder during a robbery. The prosecution's notion that Frank asked for $40 that Tracy owed him, but only collected $10, was a very weak argument for the special allegation of robbery, so the charge was dismissed. The special circumstance of the heinous nature of the murder was additionally dismissed, because the judge said that the California Supreme Court's definition of a heinous crime was too vague. The judge called Max Frank a Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, since he was a man with two distinct personalities, living two different lives. He sentenced Max Frank to 25 years to life. Frank's sister told the judge that her brother was a brilliant educator and asked the judge to allow his skill set to be useful in prison. The judge agreed, even though he made no official proclamations, and said he hoped Frank would do something positive with the rest of his life. Frank was eligible for parole after 12 years, but he would never reach that point in his sentence. On September 17, 1997, at age 67, Max Bernard Frank had a heart attack and passed away in Krikorian State Prison in Kings County, California. Thank you so much for joining me for this episode of Beyond Contempt. Please visit beyondcontemptpodcast.com for the links to the sources and music used in this episode. Research, writing, editing, audio production, and sound design were performed by me, Renee. I want to thank patrons Nigel B. and Zane H. Thank you so much for supporting the show. If you like the show, please leave me a positive review on Apple Podcasts. Thank you so much, everyone. <laughs>